here for what is um, IU's first lunch talk in 2020. So happy new year to everyone. I hope um, your 2020 is filled with lots of IU talks. Um, so our first talk today, uh, I'm really privileged to introduce Dr. Marcus Olapade as our first uh, speaker today. Um, I have had the privilege of knowing Marcus uh, for many years now. Uh, Marcus and I work together actually at the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation, or 3IE. Uh, Marcus got his PhD in 2013 from the University of Mannheim, and he holds a research master in quantitative economics from uh, University of Paris 1, the Pantheon Sorbonne. And Marcus has previously worked at the African School of Economics, um, and he was an assistant professor there and was also director of the Institute for Empirical Research in Political Economy. He is currently the managing director of C4ED, uh, Center for Evaluation and Development, who are also our partners, partners with the Independent Evaluation Unit, or the IEU, for our LORTA program. Before I go forward, I also want to introduce two other colleagues who are visiting and who are in the middle of eating their sandwiches. Um, so um, uh, Susan and Arne are also visiting us from Germany and the Center for Evaluation and Development, and all three of them are integral parts of the IEU's uh, LORTA program that we'll have a chance to speak to you a little bit during Marcus's talk, but also subsequently during our discussion. Thank you very much, all three, for being here. Uh, a little bit, a few words about the IU lunch talks. As you know, we host these um, monthly, and we like to feature speakers from around the world who are experts in fields of climate, development, um, and essentially anything that can be related to climate, which basically means the universe. Um, it, we like to feature experts who are thinking about evidence in different ways, about evaluation in different ways, and about use of evidence in different ways, so that we can make our work uh, better, faster, stronger. Um, in this respect, we are also very pleased to let you know that this talk is recorded, like all other IEU talks, and it's also featured on our website. We also encourage you to tweet using the IEU handle, which is um, at eval underscore GCF. GCF Sorry, at GCF underscore eval. So please use our Twitter handle and tweet away during the session as well. Uh, our next talk will be in February. For today's talk, we have uh, Marcus, who will be speaking for about 25 minutes, and then we'll open it up for discussion amongst all of you. Um, with that, I'm going to hand this over to Marcus. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you very much, Joe, for the kind introduction. And thank you all for being here, being interested in impact evaluation and in the work that we are doing at C4ED. So while you are enjoying your lunch, I will introduce you to our center and uh, to the work that we are doing. So who are we? So C4ED is a nonprofit organization registered, registered in Germany as a non-charitable, as a charitable, sorry, charitable organization. And we conduct impact evaluations in order to figure out what works, for whom, why, and, and under which circumstances. So if you consider an impact evaluation, we, we are able to master the entire the entire impact evaluation, but we do also provide to organizations bits and pieces of impact evaluations, like impact evaluation designs, technical assistance. We do also provide guidance on how to, on how to collect data for impact evaluations and how to quality assure impact evaluations. So what motivates us is the vision to improve the lives of the poor and vulnerable by making development interventions more effective. And so our contribution to development is to provide a public good that is evidence, information, whether an, in, an intervention works or whether it does not work. 
And we are doing so by asking quantitative questions. Quantitative questions need quantitative answers. So we're not only asking whether an intervention is effective, yes or no, but we're also trying to figure out what the order of mag magnitude of the effect is. So how effective is an intervention? And the, so the goal here is really to identify whether any development project created a 1% change in the lives of the beneficiaries or 10% or a 20% change. And to be able to attribute this in a causal way. In addition to that, we are conducting um, mixed methods, theory-based impact evaluations, where the theory is the theory of change, so each step in the intervention is assessed. And so we, we are able at the end to kind of point out where are where's room for improvement in an intervention. So where was the causal chain, for example, interrupted so that the intervention could not bring about the impact that it was aiming at. Well, this is, this is our, uh, our motivation. We do study a wide array of topics. We have worked a lot in microfinance. We have worked a lot on labor issues. Um, health issues and nutrition issues are, are being addressed by our studies. And we are also through the collaboration with IEU and with GCF, more and more developing impact evaluations in the field of environment and uh, climate change. Where we work is kind of everywhere in the global south. We do have projects in South America. We do have projects in Africa, South Asia. Uh, a whole, whole lot of projects are actually being conducted in Pakistan, where we've been in, uh, investigating um, development interventions for over 10 years now. Um, we do also have lots of projects in Ethiopia and a particular cluster also in West Africa. Our expertise is obviously in impact evaluation, as I mentioned. Our staff is predominantly um, economists, so we do have economists, econometricians, and statisticians. And we do also have a small group of of qualitative researchers. It's a small group, but it's, grow it's a growing group. So this allows us to conduct mixed methods impact evaluations. So we are complementing quantitative tools with qualitative tools, and then thus able through the quantitative tools to cover, this, to cover this causal analysis. And then with qualitative tools, we do provide more insights into the lives of the, of the beneficiaries, into the context of the projects. Yes, so we do conduct rigorous independent research that meets the highest standard of quantitative and qualitative analysis. So what goes into an impact evaluation? The key tool for us are still quantitative methods, and these can be grouped in two subsets. We do have experimental methods at our disposal and non-experimental methods. Experimental methods, as you may know, um, are what, what uh, the Nobel Prize Committee honored the work of Duflo, Banerjee, and Kramer last year. And so those are the methods that we are also, also applying. And when the, when the Nobel Prize Committee made this decision, we almost felt as if we ourselves received, uh, received the Nobel Prize, since this is really the, the bread and butter of our work. So what experimental methods do is, in order to, to evaluate a project, you randomly allocate individuals or groups of individuals into a treatment group and into a control group. And so these methods allow to, to, cancel, out or, yeah, to cancel out the selection bias. Selection bias is that whenever there's a project, people who sign up will be motivated pro people and will have some particular uh, characteristics. So by simply combining, uh, by simply comparing beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries, you are comparing apples and oranges because they might have very diff different characteristics. And now these experimental methods, they allow to have on average the same characteristics in the treatment and in the control group and thus provide unbiased results. But the difficult thing is that not in all contexts it's possible to use experimental methods. 
So some, sometimes projects have already been imp implemented. The impact evaluator wasn't available during the setting up of the project. And so in these situations, we need to refer to other uh, methods. And this is where non-experimental meth non methods come into play. And here we have a variety of choices as well. They are less rigorous than the experimental ones, but they still provide evidence. The first one, I'm not going to go too much into detail, but I'd like to provide some insights into these methods. So the first method that is uh, in the toolbox of the impact evaluator is propensity score matching. It is a purely econometric, uh, econometric method wherein you look at beneficiaries of the project and non-beneficiaries, and then through this, through this method, figure out individuals in the, in the two groups that look alike according to their, uh, to their observed characteristics and then, and then identify the impact through this. Fixed effects regression is another econ econometric method that requires observations over time. So you need to have many data collections at many points from beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries and, and then you can kind of delete or cancel out any pre-existing differences that exist between the two groups. Regression discontinuity de design is also a, um, that's actually a quasi-experimental method. So here, it's key to understand how beneficiaries were selected, and they need to be selected on some sort of index or some sort of threshold. And the idea here is that you have a threshold, let's say, for example, the poverty line, and any individual under, or imagine that any individual that is under the poverty line is eligible for the project, and so this particular method looks at people that are slightly below the threshold and slightly above the threshold, and then assumes that they are quite similar in their other characteristics. And so here, this is the, this is the key idea for, for this RDD design. Very often, we also use difference and difference uh, estimation, where you have baseline data, and endline data for beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries and can then cancel out pre-existing differences between the two groups. So you know in which way the treated and the, un the not treated or the controls were different and you can take this into account. So those are the, the key methods that we are using. There's also instrumental variable regression, but in our work we don't use it so often. The academics academics uh, use it quite, quite often though. Um, as I mentioned, I'm just brushing over these methods. If you are interested, you can uh, read them up in a textbook that was published by our colleague Markus Fröhlich, who's also the founder of C4ED. Um, you'll find lots of, lots of equations and a little bit of text, um, but I owe it to my, to my colleague to do this, um, this marketing for his work. <laughs> so, Coming a bit to the, to the operational part of, uh, of impact evaluation. So how do, we, how do we conduct an impact evaluation? So it, as the title also mentions, we are taking scientific work to evaluate real world projects. So our staff, our project leads almost always have a PhD and have, uh, have lots of experience conducting research. And they are now working together with, with implementers to, to evaluate these projects. And so, the way we, the way we, um, we do this is that we have some in-house work where we use existing evidence on the kind of intervention, of intervention that we are assessing. We are looking at project documents and we come up with a kind of exant or early draft of the design that is presented in-house. Then we go on a scoping mission in the, in the second, in the phase one. We go into, on a scoping mission to the country where we meet then the accredited entity or the implementers of the project and have intense discussions in order to understand how they are implementing the project. So what are the different steps in the project? How do they select the beneficiaries? What are the services that they provide to the beneficiaries? And this helps us to draw up the theory of change and to understand the causal change that is expected from the project. Um, also during these missions, we, we understand how the sampling can be done. Like, do we need to sample individuals? Do we need to sample um, communities or producer organizations? This is done during, during phase one and during scoping missions in country with the project team. At the, end of, at, at the end of each scoping mission, we have 
a draft impact evaluation design that was developed together with the, uh, with the implementers, and the implementers also had a chance to comment on it. On it. As I mentioned, experimental methods are the most rigorous de uh, designs, and we try to use those, but it's not always possible. And so this is what we, what we determined together with the project team. Then phase two comes the actual impact assessment, where data collection is involved, and, and uh, in phase three, we then do data analysis and uh, write the reports. And also at phase three, there's lots of back and forth with the implementers in order to discuss the results and to have an idea, also have also their ideas on board for the, for the analysis and the interpretation of the results. We do collaborate with, uh, with a lot of organizations. Um, some of the organizations we're working with, uh, the, the, the relationship has been going on for 10 years. For example, NRSP is also an accredited entity for GCF. We've done, uh, we've done work with them for over 10 years in Pakistan. It started with the evaluation of a health insurance that they provided and the impact that this health insurance has on child labor. And we are currently drawing up an, uh, a cookstove project with them. So here the collaboration is really that they are the implementers and we accompany the, imp the project with an impact e evaluation all the way through. Key, key collaborator, as Joe already mentioned, is the IEU and the LORTA project, so the Learning Oriented Real-Time Impact Assessment Program. So here, since 2018, we are enrolling GCF projects into the projects. Currently, there are 13 projects involved. In May, there'll be a workshop in uh, Rome where we will enroll another six or seven projects. We already saw the long list of projects that will be invited to that workshop and are quite excited about the prospect of our work to work with, uh, with new GCF projects. And there are some, quite some interesting uh, interventions and projects there. And what LORTA does is actually embed impact evaluation into GCF projects. So we do consult the, uh, the accredited entities on how they can uh, embed an impact evaluation, but also how they can measure their results and their, their activities um, in a, in a real-time real -time basis, on a real-time basis. And through this process, there's lots of capacity building that is going on. So for example, currently we've worked with Madagascar, in Madagascar with Conservation International, where we have done the data collection and the impact evaluation of the baseline report together with them. And they have actually done the analysis for the baseline themselves with our support. <laughs> okay, so that was the marketing part, part about C4ED. Now uh, to some research. So Solomon asked me to present a work that colleagues of ours have done on a topic that might be interesting to GCF. And um, so I'm going to speak about a project by Marcus Furlich, who is the founding, founding director at C4ID, and Alexandra Avdenko, who is our director of research. And so in this project, they're evaluating, they're evaluating activities from ACTED in Pakistan, um, where ACTED is trying to prepare uh, disaster-prone communities for, uh, for floods. In Pakistan, as you may know, um, disaster is quite frequent. So it's one of the most, most um, so it's one of the countries that sees the most disasters uh, in, in the world. It has floods, it has earthquakes, landslides, droughts, monsoons, and it's quite, yeah, the, the, the consequences of these disasters are quite harsh for, um, for poor communities. Um, there are the, obviously, there are the acute, um, acute consequences, but then there are also longer-lasting consequences. So ILO estimated that the 2010 floods in Pakistan that covered almost 25% of the entire, country, the entire country destroyed 50 million jobs. So here, in any such situation, there's lack of safe water, sanitation situation is very bad. Fertile land is submerged. You will, you will see lots of migration and there's inappropriate shelter. So there are lots of, lots of problems that need to be addressed. ACTED does so through the, 
through a basic humanitarian aid uh, package that they are delivering. So the idea here is that they're not only covering with, uh, not only dealing with the acute uh, problems, but they're also having a residual recovery package, wherein they go into communities that have suffered from floods in the past and are providing services to deal with residual consequences, but also better prepare communities for future floods or future disasters. This uh, basic humanitarian aid package has three components. It is, has a wash component, a shelter component, and food security component. Wash activities uh, include community construction of latrines, but there are also sanitation kits that are provided under the, sh under the shelter component. They are providing the knowledge on how to construct flood-resistant shelters. And, and under livelihoods, they're providing uh, agricultural, agricultural uh, knowledge or agricultural training, for example, for flood-resistant uh, flood uh, seeds, but also vaccine management for the livestock. And so these are the three, three components that are our colleagues in, uh, evaluated. The overarching uh, research question are do humanitarian aid interventions make individuals more prepared for emergencies? Second question is, can an improvement in intermediate outcomes improve life quality regardless of whether a disaster occurred or not? And then, if a disaster occurred, are households actually more prepared? And uh, our, our colleagues drew up a cluster randomized controlled trial to evaluate these interventions. This cluster randomized control trial was set up in the following way. So ACTED was active in um, the, the Sindh, Sindh uh, province of, uh, of Pakistan and in there in two, two districts, that is um, um, Bodin and Koshmar. And in those two districts, they kind of listed all the villages that are eligible for the, for the intervention and created clusters of villages. And then these clusters were, were randomly allocated into the beneficiary group and into a control group. Again, by randomly allocating them on, into, this, into these two groups, the clusters or these two, two groups of clusters should be on average similar. So before the intervention starts, they would have the same average characteristics. And any intervention that acted provided or any effect that we would see at, at the end could, be, could then be attributed to the interventions that ACTED provided. So after doing the randomization, no, actually so they first conducted a baseline survey among 4,000 households in 2015 and then started, uh, then started the intervention. Um, the outcomes they are looking at are, there are intermediate outcomes which go a bit beyond socioeconomic uh, characteristics. So the intermediate outcomes would, for example, check whether the household has understood ACTED's training and is also implementing it. So are they washing their hands using soap? Are they using latrines? Are they building, are they building these uh, drought-resistant uh, drought resistant shelters? These are intermediate outcomes. And then you have also outcomes on objective and subjective preparedness. Subjective preparedness, for example, do you feel better prepared for, uh, for disaster? During the study period, extreme weather events occurred um, in, uh, in Badin, in particular. And this is also the interesting part about the study. So it's a mixed method study. They're not only using quantitative data. They are also using qualitative data. And they're using secondary data to, to, to find out whether events, extreme weather events occurred. So they are looking at data from Pakistan's uh, meteorological agency and can thus identify in a district how, where was rainfall, the rainfall that was unusually high. And it is in 20% of, of the sample, extreme weather events occurred. So this allows to also measure then the effect on resilience against, uh, against uh, extreme weather events. The key results, and also these are now causal results, the key results are that households are objectively and subjectively better prepared for natural disaster according to the ACTED guidelines. So households 
reported in the, so in the treatment in the treatment group households reported that they are using latrines more often actually there's an eight percentage point increase in latrine usage and they all they also reported that they are use, that they are for example washing their hands with soap more often than than you would see in the control group um, so hygiene habits did improve also, due to the, the fact that a, a, an extreme weather event occurred, we are able to check whether resilience increased. And it showed that in the cases where extreme weather events occurred, the household suffered from extreme, uh, extreme weather event. Um, the occurrence of diarrhea among children reduced. And also as a result of ACTIC's intervention, the days where they were in food need also reduced. So these are, these are statistically significant impacts that the project brought about. Those are the quantitative in, uh, effects. On the qualitative side, the researchers saw that many of the households that they interviewed through in-depth interviews reported that yes, their hygiene habits, for example, to, regarding, regarding washing hands improved, but the situation for latrines is still prevalent. So, on, the, on that side, more work needs to be done. Before I end, I'd like to point you to some uh, publications that, uh, that have been done by our team. The, uh, one, one, other, one study that we did is in Ethiopia that might also inter interest you. It looks at an index insurance for pastoralists. So pastoralists in Ethiopia can buy an insurance that protects them from the consequences of drought if their cattle uh, uh, dies due to drought. Another project, that, the project I just re, uh, presented, you can uh, find it online as the Impact Evaluation Report 100 by the International, Impact, uh, International Initiative for Impact Evaluation. Um, and another project that might be of interest to you that was recently published looks at extension services and how these can be combined with video messages. So here, the researchers evaluated whether providing video messages that show the ISFM techniques that the extension officers already provided on the ground can improve the take up or the adoption of ISFM methodologies. So that was, uh, that was published in the NBER uh, working paper series. What are the implications for GCF from impact evaluation or especially from LORTA? So here again, in our work, it's, we see that it's really important to think about impact, evalu impact evaluation from the outset when you're setting up a project. So having impact evaluators accompanying the project design is, is key. Thinking about what are the indicators that we want to, to evaluate, what are the strategies that, uh, that can be applied to evaluate the project is, uh, is really important. So this is one of, one of the key learnings and um, building capacity and the financial means to evaluate project equally has high importance. I will stop here and we can turn to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus. Um, yeah, that, uh, we already have questions, so yes, questions, please. If you could introduce yourself uh, briefly, and then uh, point, yeah, phrase your question briefly as well. Okay, I'll do my very best. Thanks. Um, my name is Bridget, and I'm a consultant at the Division of External Affairs. It was a fascinating presentation, and your results were really good. I'm sorry I wasn't able to see the slides very clearly, but I hope they'll be around later. My question is on um, how do I say it? like the uh, research ethics basically, mm -hmm. around using these human subjects. I suspect in many cases these can be marginalized and disadvantaged groups. Mm -hmm. How are we seeking their consent, especially in a randomized control trial? Everyone trial, everyone knows this is the gold star and it's awesome that you're mm -hmm. doing that, but how are we able to justify applying a randomized controlled trial to these kinds of situations? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bridget. Monica? Mike, please. My name is Monica Goldberg, and I work at the Office for Portfolio Management here. And uh, I was thinking about the way you 
Uh, from your example of the latrines uh, and hand washing uh, information project, mm -hmm. apart from the beneficiaries, do you also assess like the the um, technical services potentially not being there or being there and the the, the deliverables of latrines and the politicians and uh, other factors that might actually explain a bit more about the latrines? Mm -hmm. Because you pointed out that they, they were not satisfactory working. Um, my name is Fola. I also work with OPM. I looked at, um, you said you did a cluster house city for the project, but I'm just wondering, did you only just focus on the latrine aspect, but what about the socioeconomics relating to the vulnerabilities and the livelihoods for the project? And secondly, if they had not collected baselines at the beginning, would it have been possible for you to have undertaken this impact evaluation? And if not, what would have been the possible alternative or options that you would have gone into? Thanks for the, um, for this round, last question, Yo-Yo. Hi, Yo-Yo, uh, Health and Wellbeing Specialist. Um, have you got any examples of where you've used uh, spatial sampling? Thank you very much for, for the questions. Um, okay, so regarding the first question on the ethical and uh, and moral moral questions. So, what is required for every RCT? is that we pass the impact evaluation strategy by an instant institutional or ethical re review board um, to assess whether human subjects can be harmed by this study or not. So this is, uh, this is mandatory in, uh, in our research. Um, and in, in addition to that, we are also starting every interview with the consent form. So there are obviously some um, traps regarding providing consent forms to individuals who might be illiterate, but so these are the the key uh, key uh, procedures that we are following in order to ensure that uh, that there is nobody who is getting hurt by the by the research that we are conducting. So this this is one uh, one thing the the ethical guidelines to to abide by. Yes, it's, re it's really important. The question regarding the implementation of the, of the intervention, right? So when it comes to, for example, the twin construction. And it's also something that's very interesting about this study because it uses not only the household data, it also looks at monitoring data from the implementer. So as I mentioned earlier, we, have, we are thinking about this theory of change and thinking about the different steps in an impact evaluation. And here, monitoring data from the implementers can be key in understanding who has participated, how many latrines were actually delivered, right? How, how, uh, and also for trainings, like how many trainings were delivered, who participated in the trainings. In an ideal case, we are able to, to merge the monitoring data and the household data to see whether the individual that's in our, in our sample, household sample, ha has also participated on, let's say, different modules in the, in the training, right? So we, in an optimal case, we would know the person signed up for the training course that goes, let's say, over a year, has 12 modules, and then we could point out which modules did they attend or did not attend. So monitoring data in impact evaluations is, uh, is, is really helpful in understanding, whether the theory of, in understanding where the theory of change could be interrupted. Um, Fola's question was about the socioeconomic results, right? Yes, so we did, they did also collect socioeconomic results, so for example on, uh, on income. On that side, the results are actually, there are actually no, no, neither positive nor negative results. So the status, the income status didn't change for the participants. This is one of the key results here as well. But there, this study has many more aspects that I didn't, uh, didn't draw on. They are also looking at um, psychological well-being, for example, whether this improved due to the intervention. Um, so I, 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 I really like this study, and uh, I can advise you to, to look it up and to, to read it more in detail. 
Spatial sampling is getting more and more used. So GIS data, um, we are using GIS data in some, in some situations in order to identify the distance between treated and control. But um, yes, also if you, have, if you have communities, so one problem often is the, the contamination. So if you implement an intervention, some of the effects might spill over to the control group, right? And so this is where we use spatial data or GIS data in order to understand how far are treated and control groups separated. And then, we, for example, we would set a, a barrier that, that uh, a control cluster can't be within 15 kilometers reach of a treatment cluster because then there might be the, the problem that some of the knowledge spills over to, to that. So this is, this is one way in which we are also using GIS data in our sampling approaches. Thanks, Marcus. Um, Fuller, there was that question of, you know, if there had been no baseline data that was collected, what ah, would yeah. we have done? Um, and perhaps I could just, please, yeah, please, and then please, also please. hand it over to you. So usually baseline data, and we all know this data better than anyone else, we know that GCF projects are much more likely to not have baseline data than actually have it, and hopefully we can change that collectively in all of our projects. But uh, in Baseline data is really important to see whether, for example, randomization actually took place. So it's a balanced test, right? So you need to have that because you need to see whether your control, your comparison group, and your treatment group, the one that the one that got the project, are on average similar or not. And that's why baseline data is really key. Um, of course, it also helps to give you much better contextual knowledge and helps you to do far better sample size calculations rather than looking at 100,000 people. You can actually reduce your sample size because then you know various other features and attributes of the population such as correlation, intra-cluster correlations, et cetera, using baseline data and you can reduce your sample sizes. So baseline data also gives you that contextual knowledge that you wouldn't get otherwise. Now, if you don't have baseline data, um, if your randomization is perfect and you have to have some other way to verify it rather than actually the team just saying, yes, it was perfect. So if you can really attest to the fact that your randomization was perfectly done, you actually don't need baseline data. Yeah. So, but then you have to have committed to the impact evaluation design because randomization essentially means if you randomize, you, the two groups are on average equivalent before the project. Yeah. But that's only on paper. In practice, every project that I've looked at, and I know Marcus has looked at, and Susan and Arne and the rest of my LOTA team, every project needs to have baseline data because there is no other way to verify that there will be a balance. Uh, one other thing to add to Monica's question, and then I'll hand it over back to Marcus, is um, contextual factors actually, f and Marcus talked about mixed methods, right? So. For anything that's quantitative, really important to know the context much before we even start to build the quantitative instruments, like even a survey instrument. Can't build it unless we have really good contextual and qualitative information. So actually from where we're coming, we think that qualitative information is far more critical than, than even the quantitative information because that's going to be predicate almost just about everything that we do, including the theory of change and the instruments that we build. Back to you, Marcus. OK, so sorry for having skipped the question on the, on the baseline data. Yes, so exactly. So balancing is, uh, is one thing that's for which this, uh, this data is really useful for the econometrician. Um, another, another advantage having baseline data for the econometrician is that it increases the precision of your estimates at end line. So you can then control also for the situation or the, the yeah, the, the situation before the intervention. Um, for project teams, baseline data also has an advantage because it kind of shows the project teams whether their targeting is actually accurate, right? So we collect much more detailed uh, data on the beneficiaries than any uh, monitoring uh, system usually would do. And as such, the, the project team can use this data also to verify whether they are actually targeting the individual that they, that they want to target. Thanks, Marcus. And you have an answer. 
Go for it. Your mic is, uh, yeah, you can just put it on. No, no. put it on, on it. Ah, okay. Just want to add something on the ethical question because I think it's very important and uh, often people doing impact relations don't address it very much. Um, so everyone talks about RCTs, randomized controls, as a gold standard, but it's still only a tool that applies to certain situations. And I think every evaluator has to ask the question, is that the right situation for applying that tool? And um, I think there are reasons why one would use an RCT, and one is limited resources. So you can't reach all the beneficiaries anyway. Then how do you select beneficiaries if you can't reach everyone? Then a lottery, which essentially a randomized controlled trial is, might be, might be a fair way to do it. It may not be, but it's at least an option that can be um, fair. And secondly, and that's, I think very important, it, it should be unclear whether the intervention will have positive effects. If it's already very obvious from the start that this is going to help people, don't do an, an, an RCT. Try maybe some other sort of evaluation and clearly some sort of monitoring, but not an RCT. So if, if in the case of the paper was presented, there is now an extreme weather when we have a humanitarian crisis, of course don't do an RCT. Try to have everyone the best possible way with the resources you have, right? Don't do an RCT. And then I think a third thing that's maybe often not quite clear is um, we only propose to randomize among the eligible beneficiaries. So for development programs, it often means everyone is poor anyway. So we're not going to restrict, um, uh, we're not going to give it to rich instead of to poor. Everyone will be poor, but if there are limited resources to reach all the poor, then it might be fair to do a lottery among the set of poor people that could benefit from the project. Uh, we'll do a second round of questions. Monica, Solomon, um, anyone else? Uh, yes, please. And so maybe you could, if you don't mind, if both of you don't mind, because um, it's a new speaker, so we could ask her to start and then Monica and then Solomon. Thank you for, very much for the great presentation. Uh, my name is Odd Girl. I'm from DEA. Um, uh, my question was that could you please more elab elaborate more on the, how you take your surveys like uh, if it's like if it's written or verbal and if it's verbal how do you overcome language barrier and if it's written how do you address the literature literacy rates where you're taking your surveys thank you so that's the division of external affairs dea okay and monica um, yes, um, I was curious to hear from you all three, four maybe uh, presenters here, on the baseline data. What type of baseline data is that you generally would say is missing um, in in these countries? Mm -hmm. I guess I am guessing you have population censuses and maybe land data, uh, economic data, etc. What is the real gap in your view? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Solomon. This is Solomon from IAU. Uh, thanks, Marcus, for the presentation. I'm just curious about uh, one of the findings on, on the project, impact on resilience. You indicated that there is improvement. So how did you guys measure that resilience? Is that an index or is that like a collective of different indicators uh, that you consider to be proxying resilience? Generally, as you know, re resilience is much more complex concept. It's, there's uh, some latent concept nature embedded in it. If you talk a little bit, maybe for the wider audience, it would be interesting too. Want to take it? Mm -hmm. um, so, on the on the ways in which we collect data. So the so there are, there are two types of data that we the data that we collect quantitative and qualitative data and in both cases we are using enumerators or yeah enumerators so the um, the quantitative data is collected using CAPI methods so computer assisted personal interviewing where our enumerators are trained on a questionnaire that questionnaire shows on the tablet and then they are going through the questionnaire together with the uh, the respondent and asking every question out loud. Some of the questions are then also things that the enumerators observe, like for example, 
the how, how the roof, the, the nature of the roof or the nature of the floor, these kinds of observing uh, things that can be observed. Do the children that walk around wear shoes or are they bare, barefoot, for example? Or what is the what is the way to the the how is the road paved to the household of the that they are interviewing? Um, and then on the qualitative side. Um, things are actually being recorded. The interviews, the in-depth interviews are being recorded and then analyzed using, uh, using software that, uh, that quant qualitative researchers apply. Um, on the baseline data, so your question aims at what data is missing, Monica, right? Um, so for us, we so in many, in most cases, we actually need to go back to the, we need to go to the country, even if there is a census, and collect specific data that allows us to test the theory of change. Right. So when we look at the theory of change, we would, we would, at each node, try to understand what data do we require in order to test whether this node holds and whether the, the whether the causal chain can uh, can uh, can uh, be maintained. And so this. And I, actually, in all cases, requires that we go back and understand the situation of the beneficiaries or of the of the study subjects. So, collecting household data is is key in most in, uh, most impact evaluations. But there are some examples where we can rely exclusively on administrative data. So, administrative data that's being collected by the uh, by the implementing agency in any way. So. Please. What kind of administrative data as you put it would yeah. you normally not find? Yeah. Anna, you you have a good example of an uh, of a study that uses administrative data, right? Do you wanna do you wanna explain it? DBSA? Um no, we're actually looking at uh, thinking about the the receipts the receipt study? Electricity? No, so that's the uh, DBSA. So uh, ah, okay. Should I just mention that? So, yes. Monica, for example, in the um, DBS, so DB, um, GCF has a project in South Africa. It's a DBSA, uh, so that's the accredited entity. And there, the idea is that there's a climate finance fund that's being set up, right? So, there, uh, the idea is that the fund itself is giving money to other, um, other funds, many funds, to, that will essentially give resources or loans or grants to uh, buildings, retailers, households, etc., to set up renewable energy, um, to increase renewable energy sourced electricity and energy. Now, clearly for GCF, really important to see what that change is in the use of fossil fuel energy, right? For that, you need baseline. So you need to have, you need to know what the current usage is um, from which you're going to be reducing um, uh, the fossil fuel energy usage and then the increase in renewable energy. The interesting thing when we went, when the team went down to South Africa is that they discovered that the buildings themselves are keeping real time high frequency data on energy usage by the second. In South Africa. In South Africa. It, Susan told me it blew her mind away. Yeah? So, excuse me? Okay, so the idea is that this data is already being collected and that's really good data. It's high quality and we can use it and we are going to be using it to then help understand what's the impact that GCF is making. But the, the original idea that you came up with was um, don't we, should we not presume that most areas have good administrative data? And the simple answer is clearly no. If there was a, there's a wonderful paper that's actually done by the global, um, by either Brookings or Global Development Network, uh, on the quality of data sets and administratively data, collected data in 53 countries in Africa. And they look at each one of the countries, their surveys as well as their censuses. So surveys, national surveys, as well as censuses. And they document for each country what the critical gaps in their data sets are that are nationally collected. For GCF projects, it becomes really important, and sorry, Paul, I left this out of the discussion that we had earlier. Baseline data is really important if you want to show how much of an impact GCF is making from the baseline. So if we say we are going to increase resilience by 10%, we have to know the baseline and then where we ended up with. So 
For us, it becomes really critical if we want to show impact to our board, to the world, and the community at large to have that baseline data. And baseline data, of course, can be collected depending on how much we want to say we are doing at the community level, at the muni municipality, community, whatever, but also at the household. And then subsequently, if we want to disaggregate it and say, well, women are benefiting so and so, then we definitely need to have intra-household data as well. So this can change, and there's no quick answer or soundbite to give as a response to that, other than saying that we need it. That was my question. Be it health, be yeah, it gender, uh, be I it... I think we're all yeah. super excited while answering that question. So Susan and then Arne and... Yeah, thanks. Um, I think there's no general answer to your question, even though it's a very interesting and important question, because the data that we need really depends on what we want to measure. So we need to think about what is the question that we are trying to answer. And from the question, we can think about what kind of indicators do we need. And then we can think about what kind of potential data sources are there. Maybe we can work with satellite information, which we are doing in some of our LOTA projects. Maybe we can use administrative data, as in the case of this DBSA project. But very often, there's no existing data source that gives us exactly the kind of indicators that we want. And even if we find one, we need to make sure that we have this information for our treatment and for a comparison group. If we are interested in doing an impact evaluation, we need it for both. Because otherwise, we, you know, we need to compare our treatment, our changes in treatment, to something. So that was the, that was the challenge, even though we have this really amazing data in South Africa on, you know, real-time energy usage, uh, we need to see what we can get for a comparison group. And that, that was the challenge. We may have an, a solution for that. But it's not only, so at least for us as impact evaluators, it's not only the information we need for the treated, we also need information for whatever we are comparing them to. Yeah, quick response, just because you ask for stuff that is not, often not available. Um, so for instance, agricultural yields, household level income, and these are so noisy, meaning they are so widespread and often very uh, imprecisely measured. So even when another firm collected the baseline and has this, we often don't trust it uh, because we've seen the data doesn't make any sense. And um, so ideally also, the same firm that you are trusting to do the good end line analysis should also be collecting the baseline because then it will be the same questionnaire, the same instrument, and um, hopefully then we'll get rid of a few of the errors in there. Yeah, thank you so much for that both. Um, unless there are burning questions, um, well actually I am going to invite you to have um, separate conversations immediately after this. If you have the time, if you have the time, just come and besiege uh, Marcus and Arne and Susan, who'll be here for about. Oh, sorry, sir. Oh, yeah, I'm so a... sorry. Yeah. Okay, so sorry, Solomon. There was a question on the resilience yeah. from the study, right? Um, exactly. So the study doesn't. So in that study, they don't. Um, they don't. I don't recur, uh, remember that they would draw up a resilience indicator or index. They are looking at the individual items that they're asked in the questionnaire. And so some of the results that I maybe didn't present, but that they, that they found is, for example, on the, on, they're looking, for example, whether damaged, whether respondents have damaged shelter. Yeah? <laughs> there was, there was Siri. Siri. <laughs> Thank you, Siri. So it's more like individual, individual indicators. Short answer. Thank you, Siri. Thank you, Solomon and Siri. Uh, and so uh, with that, yeah, I'm just going to say, please come and surround them if you'd like to for about 15 minutes, kindly. And then we're going to take them back to the 17th floor to continue our discussions. Uh, but I also want to thank all of you for being a very interested and engaged audience. And we're going to have our next lunch talk will be in February. 
and we're going to feature a professor from um, Korean, from Seoul National, I beg your pardon, from Seoul National University, um, who'll be here, and we'll let you know the dates and topic very soon. But thank you very much again, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.